Will you pray with me, please? God, open the words of these, this text by the power and movement of your spirit in our lives. And let the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts glorify you. Not only in this place, not primarily in this place, but in all the other places that you call us to go, the sanctuaries of our homes and workplaces, of schools and playgrounds, of coffee shops and meeting places. Wherever we go, O oh God, give us the courage and the power and the promise that Mary felt that day so that we too may proclaim, I have seen the Lord, and the world may come to believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I know just about everybody here came today expecting to hear the story of Jesus' resurrection. I mean, it is Easter Sunday. And contrary to the commercialization of this day, it is not primarily about chocolate, eggs, rabbits, or even beautiful hats. It is about God's surprising work that breaks through human expectations and convictions when we are certain that no more work can be done. But the story this morning is not God's alone. And I think, in fact, if it were, we might not even be here today. For you see, at the heart of the Easter is the reality of relationship, the interconnection between the divine and human activity. It is in many ways the Christmas story of incarnation again, but this time not into Jesus. It is the incarnation of God's Spirit in us, in you, and me. Easter is about what happens in human lives when we finally encounter the true power, the presence, and the purpose of God's love set free in the world and discover life where before only death existed. And we begin to live, truly live, as if that power resides in us. So I want to propose to you today that today's story is more about Mary Magdalene, the first apostle, than maybe it is about Jesus, which in many ways makes it much more terrifying for all of us. Because if that story is more about Mary, more about what happens to her as she runs smack dab into what God's love can really do, bringing even dead things to life, then that cuts a whole lot closer to home. It says that something about Easter not being a show we watch, but rather a life in which we participate. It is about belief diving deep within us, grabbing hold of our heart as well as our head and changing our lives so much so that we have to do as Mary did and run from the tombs that we encounter in the world and proclaim, I have seen the Lord. Now Mary's transformation begins, as many things do, in the dark. Everything for which she had begun to hope was crushed within her as she went through the city streets, outside the gate to the place where Jesus or Joseph had placed Jesus' body. Why did she go? I mean, she had no expectation that the tomb would be open, that the body would be missing. Maybe she went to be as near to the one she had come to call Lord as possible, to sit by the tomb and to talk to him, telling him all that she had longed to say to him when life was still within him, to tell him how much she loved him and how much his love for her had meant to her. Maybe she went to confirm that Jesus' death had actually happened, lost in disbelief as we too are often after tragic and devastating losses. Maybe she went because she didn't know what to do with herself, unable to sleep, overcome by despair and grief. But whatever, whatever her reasons, Mary went to the tomb, to a place of endings and finality, at a time when there was no light, literally and figuratively. 
There are many places in our world today that feel like tombs, like places of finality where no light penetrates and hope is lost. In the Syrian town of Khan Shekahon, a woman who gave her name as Um Ahmed, which means mother of Ahmed, shared in her deepest sorrow, if the world wanted to stop this, they would have done so by now. One more chemical attack in a town the world hasn't heard of won't change anything. I'm sorry. My son died yesterday. I have nothing left to say to the world. How many people have nothing left to say to the world? People like Maribel Trujillo Diaz. She's 42 years old and she's awaiting deportation to Mexico from a center in Louisiana after a 15 year fight for asylum in this country. While her four US born children ages 14 to three with the youngest with severe special needs are left in Ohio without her. Or maybe people like Dave and Hannah Edwards' transgender daughter who was bullied out of her kindergarten due to ignorance and intolerance. Maybe veterans who return from war and need a physical, psychological, and spiritual healing only discover that their nation is all too willing to pay for them to go to war, but doesn't seem capable of paying for their care upon return. Or families at their wits end because of watching young people lose themselves in drugs or crime. People find, suddenly find themselves without work and no idea how they will pay the rent or put food on the table. Spouses watching as their loved one slips into the grips of Alzheimer's. Well, this list could be endless, for there are many places in our world and situations which people are facing today that feel like tombs like places of finality where no light penetrates and all hope is lost. But it is at the places of ultimate dead end that God breaks through the human limitations and imaginations to surprise us with new possibilities. Mary finds the stole rolled away and the tomb empty. Now, her first response is confusion and alarm. In the dark, it's hard to recognize new beginnings. She doesn't understand what she sees, and so she hurries back to the city, turning to, to others who have walked with her on this journey. And so Peter and the beloved disciple, they race each other to the tomb. And there they find grave clothes that have been left behind. Important for what thieves would have taken the time or the care to wrap up the headcloth and lay it carefully and neatly aside. Finding it empty, as Mary reported, John tells us the disciples believed. And then they went home. Home. No proclamation, no sharing, just back to the safety of their homes. And I have to wonder if Mary didn't look at them a bit aghast. Believe? What did you believe? Where are you going? You're just going home? Well, maybe miraculously, when they saw the empty tomb, their first thoughts were that Jesus had been resurrected. And it would be how it, like it was when Lazarus was resurrected. Jesus would be among them again, picking up where he left off. Jesus would do the transforming. Jesus would build the relationships. Jesus would do the healing. And as disciples, they would watch or accompany Jesus while he did what Jesus did. I mean, that empty tomb thing is going to be a great selling point for him, don't you think? Lots more people would want to follow him after that. But the problem with this is that it was all still up to Jesus in their mind. An empty tomb on its own, it seems, isn't something that doesn't require much of us. And belief in itself may not be the most important factor in responding to the amazing story of resurrection. We can be wowed by the power of an empty tomb, but not really touched by it. Jesus is Jesus, beloved of God, Messiah, Prince of Peace, Lord and Savior, second part of the Trinity, the resurrected one. 
We can believe all sorts of things about Jesus as the Christ, the anointed of God. And those beliefs can make little to no difference in our lives. You see, if Easter is primarily a pageant we watch, a, a drama carried out for us as an audience, an amazing event that happened to Jesus alone, then not much will change in the world. And if we're satisfied with sufficient brass fanfare, a few timpani, an abundance of lilies, shouts of yay God, and going home content for another year, we will continue to see tombs closed and death holding sway in our world. You see, at that first moment, the disciples didn't initially connect the empty tomb with their lives. And that's the rub of resurrection. It calls for relationship, for engagement. It turns things upside down so that the status quo is no longer sufficient. Resurrections are disruptive, and they impact who we are and what we do. That's why it's so much easier to let Jesus take care of things. This last Thursday, there was an important demonstration by a large group of interfaith clergy and civil rights advocates at the Metropolitan Detention Center to protest the harsh arrest and deportation policies in the recent months by ICE in our area. Now, I got the notice, and I put a flag by it on my calendar. But I have to admit, I thought about all I had to do for this weekend and would have to rearrange in order to participate. I even tried to pretend I forgot it was happening. As Thursday morning dawned, I just decided I was too busy. And yet I knew as soon as I would read reports about the action that I would regret not going. And I did. Like the disciples who believed and went home, my to-do list took precedence over my proclamation that I believe God's way is mightier than unjust laws. And it wasn't just the act of the demonstration I missed so much as it was the opportunity for relationship building, sharing and justice making with my friends and colleagues, and more importantly, learning from those most impacted by the policies. I missed the opportunity to begin to learn their stories and to understand their walk of life. Yeah, it's a whole lot easier than we think to let the amazement of an empty tomb be enough for us. But that ultimately isn't enough if we want to participate in God's resurrection work. Mary, on the other hand, she stayed with her grief and her uncertainty at that open tomb, waiting. And as light begins to break on the horizon, she has one of those hair-raising moments when she can tell that someone's behind her. And she turns and she asks the man who she assumes must be the gardener where he has taken the body of her Lord. And in her sorrow, she doesn't recognize Jesus, even when he first speaks to her. But through the haze of her grief and when she hears her name being called, everything changes. In that beckoning, in that moment of personal connection, of relationship, she recognizes the voice of the one who loved her. Mary. As her name is called, she discovers a new purpose for her life. What she feared is true. The future is not going to be the same as it was. Jesus tells her he is not going to be among them as he has been. He's going to God from where he had come, to his God and to her God and to everyone's God. But in that moment, she seems to begin to understand what Jesus had told them in a new way and that the reality of God would be with her through life and into death, and then even beyond death, into some kind of new life. And something new begins to emerge in her heart as a possibility. And calling Jesus teacher now takes on an entirely different dimension. For she suddenly, I suspect, begins to realize that what he's been teaching her, mentoring her in, is now for her to pick up and to live out. So now it will be Mary and Peter, and John, and Thomas, and all the rest who had learned at Jesus' feet, who will then bear this good news of God into the world in Jesus' name. What he has shown them as a way of life, his being, the way, takes on new power. 
And Mary has seen the risen Lord, and he has sent her into the world to proclaim that God is not defeated by human action and is not contained by human boxes of any type, even tombs. Mary discovered the relationship of resurrection and the power that it gives to bring life out of death. And her proclamation began the next part of God's story with the world. Now, of course, Easter is about Jesus and God. Without them, Mary wouldn't have had a mission or a purpose. It is ultimately the power of God that is why we gather here and is ultimately about Jesus' love and trust of God that we have an Easter morning. But it is also about us, too, just as it was about Mary. We are invited to discover in this day the possibility of possibilities. Where we see dead ends, we are to look for new directions. Where we see injustice, we are to act with truth tempered in mercy. Where we see hatred and violence, we are to respond with love and peace. Now sometimes that work will require heading towards tombs that we sure are closed. And sometimes it will mean waiting when we find that stones have already been rolled away. And sometimes it will mean listening for our name through the depths of grief. And sometimes it will mean running to proclaim that we have seen the Lord and that nothing else will ever be the same. Former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the man who defended his country from the Nazis in World War II, and he passed away at the age of 90 in 1965. He had carefully designed his own funeral service down to the most minute detail. At its close, following the benediction, a single trumpeter stood at the west end of St. Paul's Abbey and sounded taps, the song that signals dusk and the close of another day and is frequently played at the end of a military funeral. It was a fitting end to the service. But after a moment of stillness that followed that last plaintive note of that song, another trumpeter stood at the east end of St. Paul's, the end that faced the rising sun and played reverie. The song of the morning and the call to a new day. Churchill perceived that Christ's resurrection signals above and beyond all else that our God is a God of new life and never-ending possibility. There is a call on our lives to, to get up, to get to work, to follow the one who was sent to lead us. And in the words of the great spiritual, it's the great getting up morning. Mary Magdalene became the first apostle because she encountered God's new life outside of an empty tomb, anchored in the sure promise that God would have the last word, and that word is one of light and life and grace and mercy and love and peace. She was commissioned to proclaim, I have seen the Lord. May we go forth this morning yearning for a resurrection relationship that sends us to do the work Mary began so long ago. Amen. Let us pray. God, on this day we seek to crown you with many crowns, to say and to proclaim that you are the Lord of our life, the Lord of all life, to inspire in us the courage of Mary to to do more than believe, but be willing to proclaim, to share, to witness, to testify that we have seen your new life in unimaginable places, in rock-strewn and hard places, in dead ends, and in death, that we have seen your movement 
We have seen your creativity. We have seen your spark, and that in the, calls out in us hope for a new day. As we gather, we lift in before you all those who are named in our prayers this morning, in our hearts and in our bulletin. We lift before you all those who lead the church, especially our Bishop Grant and our District Superintendent Jim, and our sister congregations of Grace Korean and Holliston United Methodist Churches. We remember Littleton United Methodist Church in Colorado, our partner congregation in these days as we await the work and word of our judicial council. We lift up those who are in grief, Vanello's family. We lift up those who need healing, Marta Ramirez, Ellen Merrill, Lucy Patrick, Diego Gomez. Be in those places of God where there is brokenness and pain and anguish, where there's need for healing and hope and new life. Let your resurrection power seep into those places and those situations in ways that hope is rekindled and trust is undergirded. And we celebrate new life of Jane Mendez and Nora Grace Goldstein. Let new life be assigned to us again of the promise that you give us that you will be with us in all things through all days and that we might hold on to the light of new life no matter the darkness that we face. God, we seek you to be the one who is the guider, the leader, the shaper, the director, the motivator, the prodder of our life. So on this Easter morn, we recommit ourselves to doing more than believing, being more than excited by a beautiful service, but by giving you our whole life, all that we are, so that we might be your resurrection people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.